live. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us again uh, for our latest webinar program at the Museum of Culpeper History. Uh, our guest tonight is Dr. Catherine Jones with the University of California. And she is going to be speaking to us about research that she has been doing here in Virginia about the juvenile justice system uh, in the Reconstruction era, uh, that being the era right after the Civil War uh, when we were dealing with a, uh, a new class of citizenships that had, a new class of citizens uh, that had just joined uh, our country uh, through the effects of the Civil War. Um, so uh, she's going to be talking a lot about, uh, you know, Af African-American experience and, and specifically women uh, in the uh, in the juvenile justice system here in Virginia. Um, just to remind you, if you have questions, uh, you can enter those in the uh, comments section of the Facebook page. And uh, I'll also, and we'll, we'll come back with a Q&A session afterwards and I'll relate those questions to Dr. Jones. Uh, and with that, I will turn that over to, to you, Catherine. Great. Right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, John, for having me and the invitation to speak. And thanks to all of you who may or may not be out there in the virtual world um, for taking time on a Friday evening to, to check in. Um, and I, I'll say I'm very happy to be back in Virginia, if only virtually, having grown up in Lynchburg and Alexandria and made my way through Culpeper many times. So, so I'm, I'm honored to be here. And I'm also really delighted to share um, some of my research, um, which has been funded by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, as well as my own home institution of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, most of this research was done at the Library of Virginia, which I imagine some folks watching may have visited in Richmond, which is a, just an extraordinary resource um, for historians, genealogists, all kinds of people. So, so this research has really um, has been greatly enriched by, by the expertise of, of um, archivists and scholars there. So um, before I go into the talk, I'll just, just so you know, I'm going to be looking off to a different screens. So, so I will um, just don't be, I'm, I'm still here as I wander off. Um, and I'm going to share a few slides as, as part of the talk. Um, so before I get into telling you the story of Mary Booth, which is the real center of, of this talk, um, I thought I'd say a little bit about how I came to this project to give you a little context about the, the history I'm interested in and where I think this fits into some larger stories. Um, and so this talk came out of really a begin with a different book project, my first book project, where I was um, doing research on the history of families after the Civil War. And while I was doing that research, I kept running into children in unexpected places, um, showing up before a magistrate accused of public drunkenness or showing up in the records of city jails and, as it turns out, even the Virginia Penitentiary. And so I was, I was curious about those stories, but they didn't really fit in the project I was working on then, but they sat there simmering at the back of my mind. And then I, like um, I imagine many of the people in the audience over the past 10 years, um, became aware of a phenomenon that certainly is much older. Um, that is the phenomenon of, of hearing stories about children, especially children of color um, who had been caught up in the criminal justice system um, and perhaps even um, equally troublingly the stories of children of color who had no involvement with the criminal justice system but found themselves um, in danger just moving through public streets because of assumptions about, um, about their connections to crime that sometimes had deadly consequences. And so as I thought back on those stories I'd encountered and the, the stories I was hearing in the news in the 21st century, I found myself thinking about what were the connections potentially between these periods of American history, that period right after the Civil War, the period of Reconstruction where African-American citizenship has been affirmed in the Constitution, um, but also where societies and formerly enslaved um, communities are, are really putting themselves back together. So that's part of the background to this story. Um, so in the larger project, Project, I'm really looking at the history of state punishment of children in Virginia. And I'm interested in questions like how it was that children came to be sent to the state penitentiary, um, which was the institution that was really reserved 
for people convicted of the most severe crimes. It was, um, we're so used to the enormous scale of prison systems in the US in the 21st century. It's important to remember in the 19th century, it was still a very extraordinary thing to be sent to a penitentiary. And so how it was that children ended up there is part of what I'm trying to answer. I also wanna know who they were. Um, were some children more likely to be sent to the penitentiary than others? Um, and the short answer to that is yes, the, the vast majority of incarcerated children were African-American children. And so understanding how that pattern came to be is part of what I'm trying to investigate in the larger project. And finally, the third big question of the project I'm interested in is, you know, what do these patterns tell us about how people in the 19th century understood what it meant to be a child? Um, and so, and how did other aspects of people's identities, um, whether it's racial identity or gender identity or their class identity, how did those things fit into our ideas in the 19th century about what childhood meant? So, so I'm interested in those big structural questions, but I'm also really interested in trying to understand simply more about the lives of children who went through the experience of incarceration. Um, and so part of my objective in talking to you this evening and in the larger project is to recover some of the details about those people um, who spent ch childhoods in, in the confines of a penitentiary and to try to understand more about their particularities, their families, um, their individuality, the very things that a penitentiary in many ways was designed to suppress. So, so that's, that's the bigger picture of the project. And now I'm gonna um, go tell you a little bit more about the Virginia Booth, the person's at the center of this. So I'm gonna share my screen to just um, share a few slides to, as a kind of backdrop to this. Um, and um, and I assume John, you'll you'll pipe up if something's not not visible. So um, let me just get the view set up, and then we'll go from there. Okay. So um, when I so in my talk today, I'm going to focus on Mary Booth, and and part of what I want you all to kind of hold in mind is this idea that I, I really want to think about both understanding the life of Mary Booth, but also what her life can tell us about how Virginia was and was not transformed by the Civil War and emancipation that came out of that war. So that's the kind of big backdrop here. So when I began the research, I've spent a lot of time um, going through the, the registries of the Virginia Penitentiary, and there's an image of one up on the screen right now. And I came across an entry for Mary Booth. And that entry conjured up a person, a girl who is about 14 years old, not quite five feet tall, so she's a little bit shorter than I am, so I could pretend to be six feet tall right now. Um, and she had dark ginger colored skin with a small scar on her forehead. These were the details that the intake officer at the penitentiary recorded when she arrived at the institution. And the register also revealed, and I'm going to go to a detailed image so you can maybe make it out a little bit better. It revealed that on November 17th, 1882, Virginia Booth, Mary Booth, excuse me, was confined to the Virginia Penitentiary after the governor had commuted her sentence from hanging to life in prison. And the record also revealed that she did not serve out that life sentence, but was instead released on Christmas Eve, 1885. So in the confines of this one little entry, we had a really complicated story that provoked a lot of questions for me. I wanted to know who Mary Booth was, um, what had been that conviction that had initially resulted in a death sentence that had then been retracted and commuted to life in prison. And how did that sentence come to be commuted yet again? Um, so twice her sentence was commuted. And as I looked at Mary Booth's entry, it also reminded me of a much better known case that is the case of a woman, a girl named Virginia Christian. She was 17 years old um, and she was employed in domestic service to a white household in Virginia. Um, and she was convicted of murdering her employer, a woman named Ida Belote. Um, and in the wake of that, she was sentenced to death. So on August 16th, 1912, Virginia Christian became the first woman and by my definition, also the first child being under 18 years of age to be executed by the state of Virginia. So in some ways, what I'm going to kind of structure the talk around is thinking about what accounts for those different outcomes. Um, with Mary Booth receiving clemency, that ultimately made it possible for her to be released from prison, and Virginia Christian instead being sentenced to death, and that sentence actually being carried out despite groundswells and national protest movement that, that tried to convince the state to um, suspend her sentence. And I think these different outcomes are all the more striking when we think about the fact that the years between them marked, uh, were marked by the state of Virginia's growing role in protecting children um, through things like labor regulation, public health measures, 
and an emerging juvenile justice system. So that's part of the backdrop. So as part of, as I move forward in the project, and sorry, I'm just gonna show you one slide. So I don't, there are no images of Mary Booth, um, but this is the image of Virginia Christian, um, the young woman who was executed by the state of Virginia um, in, in 1912. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna talk about really the center of the story is Mary Booth. And so after I had found this entry in the prison register, I, I set about trying to learn as much as I could about Mary Booth. And it's a challenging enterprise because um, Booth is not a kind of historical figure who left behind a lot of paper. I don't have any letters or diaries. Um, they probably, I don't even know if they existed, but they certainly have not survived in the hands of archives that can make their way for me as a historian. So in order to try to reconstruct Mary Booth's life, I have to rely on, on all kinds of evidence that come from other places. So you can see in this image, the evidence that comes from the circuit court minute book from Surrey County in Virginia, that's housed at the Library of Virginia, but also um, newspaper coverage, um, as well as materials that, that come from government records, like the, the governor's papers of Virginia. So it's by kind of piecing together all of these traces that, that I've tried to, to reconstruct as much as I can of the story of Mary Booth's life. So what we know is that Mary Booth was born around 1868 to Harriet and Benjamin Booth in Surrey County on the south side of the James River. And that is the same year that the state of Virginia held a constitutional convention that produced a new legal framework for the state one that affirmed the permanent abolition of slavery, extended voting rights to all men, and created a fledgling system of public schools open to all children. So this is part of that transformation of affirming Black citizenship, not just at the federal level, but also at the state level. And the lives of the Booth family had also been changed by recent developments. Um, Benjamin and Harriet Booth had almost certainly been enslaved prior to the Civil War, but by 1880, they had their eight children um, living together in a household in Surrey County. And that is marked one of the real transformations of emancipation that African-Americans could expect to live as families, to have autonomy over the domestic life, something that slavery had made impossible. But the lives of the Booth family would be radically disrupted on April 7th, 1882, when Clara Gray and Travis Jones died at Mount Pleasant Plantation in Surrey County, Virginia, apparently having been poisoned. So Clara Gray and her husband, Reuben Gray, had moved to Virginia from Chicago just a few years prior when they acquired the plantation. What drew the couple to Virginia is unclear, um, but the evidence I've been able to find suggests that Reuben was somewhat troubled, a man in need of frequent fresh starts, and also Clara had a sister who lived in a nearby county, um, and so perhaps that's part of why they landed in Surrey. A few days after the deaths, authorities arrested Martha Jones and Mary Booth, both of whom worked at the Gray's property. And the sensational story quickly attracted the interest of the Virginia press, and it reported the story in really different terms. Some highlighted Mary Booth's youth, others called her a notorious character. Some said she had confessed and others said that she was innocent. Um, but regardless of the reporting, it's clear that the story of the idea of a young black girl who had murdered her white employers um, caught the attention of editors, not just in Virginia, but across the United States. And the story got picked up in places from Georgia to New York. Um, and by May 24th, local authority suspicions had settled on Mary, but now also her sister, Virginia, who was a year older, 15. And both girls were arraigned for trial in the Surrey County Court. So why do suspicions ultimately land on the Booth sisters? Well, the precise developments that led the local sheriff to settle on the Booth girls as the likely culprits are unclear. Um, but it does seem clear from what I've been able to find that the girls weren't simply railroaded. Um, there was evidence collected, there was testimony, there was some civil procedure. Yet, it's also really important to note that the investigations clearly overlooked another obvious and it would eventually become clear correct suspect. That was Reuben Gray, the husband of Clara Gray, one of the victims. So from the earliest reporting on the case, it was clear that he was present on the morning of the deaths and that he avoided poisoning by not drinking the coffee that appeared to have killed his wife and the overseer on their farm. Although no records of the investigation survive, it seems likely that the Booth girls role as domestic laborers along with their youth and their race 
mattered just as much as testimony and timelines in elevating them as suspects. So part of what I'm arguing is that there was already available to Virginians at this time, a narrative, an expectation that um, female servants, especially African-American female servants um, who attacked their employees, um, that, that, was a, that was a standard story that Virginians recognized. And so that was a story that authorities attached to, but it was also a story that a murderer could use to redirect suspicion away from himself. Um, and so, so part of what I, I argue um, in my research is that, that it's really not just the facts of the case that make Mary Booth sub, ultimately the person who's convicted, but also assumptions um, about what her identity meant. So Mary Booth's employment as a domestic worker in the Gray's home made her a likely suspect, not only because it put her in the venue of the crime, but also because it conflicted with her identity as a child. In 1880s Virginia, as in many post-emancipation societies, so places remaking themselves after the destruction of slavery, the prescribed model of domestic life assumed that children's labor would be confined to the family economy. So that's the expectation, but it's really hard to achieve in practice. And it's just worth to underscore here, under the system of slavery, enslaved children's labor was at the command of their owners rather than their parents. And so one of the things that the destruction of slavery meant um, was the establishment of a system of free labor um, that ensured that parents would be able to command their children's labor, um, regardless of their racial identity, and elevated the idea that children's labor ideally should be confined to the family. But in reality, most families, and especially recently emancipated families, needed the labor and often the earnings of their children simply to get by. So remember, at the end of slavery, formerly enslaved people got no compensation for the work they'd been doing for generations, um, and they often faced severe discrimination in employment and compensation. So, so whole families needed to band together to be able um, to navigate those circumstances. So, but in this context, in this period, working children then were both commonplace, but also a little bit suspect. Um, and so I think that's part of what helps us understand why Mary Booth comes to the surface uh, as a suspect. I also wanna note that domestic labor was a dangerous proposition for girls in the 19th century. So historians like the Bully of Blimp um, have demonstrated that, that violence and threats of sexual violence were commonplace in domestic workers' lives. But that's not just an observation of 21st century historians. W.B. Du Bois, who had done research um, in Virginia's social conditions in the late 19th century, noted that Black Virginians were really dissatisfied with domestic service as a kind of employment. And he cited specifically concubinage, that's the word he used, as the greatest danger confronting girls, meaning the menace of, of sexual harassment um, by employers. So this was a, a sense of the danger of this work was circulating in the 19th century, as well as being documented by historians in the present. So it seems very likely that the Booth parents recognized the dangers domestic labor presented, but they had to balance that against the dangers of poverty. So just to give a little bit more context, in 1880, Harriet Booth and Ben Booth, um, Harriet was 20 and Ben was 34, and they had eight children ranging from ages two to 14. I don't find any indication that the children attended school during this time, which along with evidence of their employment outside the home, suggests the parents were unable to forego their labor or the income that it could bring. Um, and so that's part of what explains why Mary Booth was working for the Grays to begin with. So if the Booths had to kind of balance this concern, they also had reason to think that maybe the Grays would be an okay place to work because for one, it was relatively close to their household. And that meant that the people who worked there could still sleep at home rather than having to live out with employers. Um, and furthermore, there were multiple members of the family employed there. Mary, Virginia, and Harriet, their mother, all worked for the Grays, as did a couple of other women. So, so there were people who could kind of surveil what was happening, trying to make sure that people were being treated okay. And so while it seems clear that the Booth parents attempted to insulate their children from some of the gravest dangers of domestic employment, Mary Booth's trial demonstrates that they were powerless to protect her from a subtle but more profound hazard. That is the way that her labor undercut access to the deference and protection that came with being recognized as a child. So, so what I'm suggesting is that her very, the nature of employment made people fail to really register her identity as a child. And that's part of what put her in a dangerous situation. 
Booth was a nurse. That's what the records of the penitentiary tell us. And nurses, whether they were attending to children or adults, carried a lot of responsibility. For child nurses, um, assuming the responsibility for the care of others made young domestic workers look less like children and more like adults. The figure of the young female black domestic worker was a complex one in the post-war imagination of white Southerners. It was an object both of desire and an object of fear. And I think that's part of what made Mary Booth, again, rise to the surface as a suspect. Because on one hand, black female domestic labor was the foundation of white domestic order, um, domestic order um, specifically. And indeed at the heart of the image of domestic ease and refinement that promoters of the post-war South advertised to the nation and which might even have helped draw the grays to Surrey County was this promise uh, of black domestic labor. So, so this is part of the fantasy as well as something that people feared. Um, so on the one, on the other hand, child workers in homes of families that were not their own also challenged Reconstruction's promise of familial domestic integrity and education, the idea that education was the proper pursuit of all children, whether they were black or white. So there's just a tension here in, in how people respond to the, the reality of children's labor within other people's households. So going back to the story of, of the trial, after the arraignment, Mary and Virginia Booth were confined to the Surrey County Jail, a small building adjacent to the old courthouse. Most Virginia jails were notoriously insecure, which must have made the threats of lynching swirling around Surrey County in April 18, 1882, especially terrifying for the sisters. If people wanted to break into the Surrey County Jail, there wouldn't be much to stop them. So while confined to that space, separated from their family, the girls must have contemplated the question that confronts historians as well. Could black girls accused of killing a white woman get a fair trial in 1880s Virginia? And there's a lot of reason to think the answer to that is no. There was a lot to fear for Mary and Virginia Booth. Um, this is a period where we see the number of incarcerated African-Americans skyrocket in part because the system was really structured against them at the level of laws that were passed, but also how criminal justice was executed. But there were also reasons to think that recent political developments had actually improved their prospects for justice. So building on the foundations of interracial political cooperation of the Reconstruction era, a new party, the Readjuster Party, um, had emerged in Virginia. It was also a biracial party supported by both black and white Virginians. Um, and it had formed around the effort to reduce the state's debt that it had, had accumulated during the Civil War. At the same time, they would ensure continuity in new state services like public schools. Um, and so they had won control of the General Assembly in 1879. And in 1881, they won control of the governor's office. And the Readjuster Party pursued judicial and legal reforms um, related to criminal justice. They set about abolishing the whipping post. They appointed over 100 judges um, in the state of Virginia. And they also pursued police reforms. So in Surrey County, which was a black majority county, um, they also the Readjuster Party had um, had taken power, and they had the the residents of Surrey County had voted in Readjuster representatives. And also in this time, African-American men not only were active political participants, but they also held office in Surrey County, um, having been elected to roles as magistrates and constables and overseers of the poor. So, so what this means is that in this period when Mary Booth was facing trial, the influence of the Readjuster Party significantly improved the prospects for African-Americans to access more meaningful justice um, in a place like Surrey County. And I'll concede that the fairness of the trial is, is difficult to judge in the absence of full transcripts and court papers, um, but it is clear that the sisters had representation and, and serious representation. They had court-appointed counsel, a man named R.E. Boynkin, a lawyer based in Smithfield, who later became the state's attorney for Isle of White County. And the records indicate that he actively represented them. He eliminated jurors during voir dire. He made motions on their behalf. Um, and so, so it seems like he was genuinely trying to represent them in a meaningful way. The jury also included eight African-American men and four white men. And so that's something that's distinctive in this period. And the judge who presided over the trial was a Republican. Um, and, and so for all of these reasons, there's, there's, a, there's reason to be optimistic that this was a genuine trial trying to get to the truth of the matter. Um, there was also lengthy, there was a lot of evidence shared. So it was not just a perfunctory enterprise, but it's also 
clear that no members of the Booth family testified. So this was really the story of the Commonwealth and other witnesses. At the end of the day, on June 30th, 1882, the jury found Mary Booth guilty of murder in the first degree and the death of Clara Gray. The trial against her sister, was Virginia, was continued, but it was not pursued. And I sadly do not really know why. The records don't explain. Um, there was one holdout juror who did not want to convict because he knew a conviction meant a death sentence, wanted to hold out instead for a sentence that would confine her to, to prison. Um, but he ultimately gave in. And so Mary Booth was not only convicted, but she was also sentenced to be executed. And Judge Arnold set the date of execution for November 17th. 1882. And in some ways, Mary Booth's youth is the dog that didn't bark in the court records. Nobody mentions it, um, despite the legal concept known as capex doli, which held that children between the ages of seven and 14 enjoyed a presumption essentially of innocence, the incapacity to do harm. And even legal commentaries at the time suggested that no juries could be brought to convict an offender as young as 14, noting, quote, that modern humanity would revolt against such severity. But Mary Booth's conviction and her long uncertain wait for clemency suggest that that legal commenter's confidence regarding popular consensus about youth and mercy really were unwarranted. Um, and I think another thing that's important to know in the 19th century, juries in Virginia really hewed very closely to the law. They, they did not tend to just kind of um, rule from, from the jury box. They would follow the instructions of the judge, but they would often then sometimes immediately turn it around to suggest that the judge should seek clemency. So they would convict, but then say, but something should be done so this person isn't punished in the most extreme way. And that's, that's exactly what happened in the case of Mary Booth. Almost immediately after the jurors convicted her and she was sentenced to death, they signed a petition to the governor recommending executive clemency and suggesting that her sentence be commuted from death to imprisonment for life. Um, and there were other petitions that followed, all of which kind of centered on her youth. But despite these campaigns, Mary Booth spent July, August, September, October, and November sitting in the Surrey County Jail awaiting her hanging and we can only imagine hoping for a reprieve. Boykin prepared the initial appeal for executive clemency immediately after the trial's conclusion on June 30th. On September 18th, 1882, Boykin again wrote the governor to renew his appeal. And in his letter, you can sense he's really frustrated. He's like, come on, you gotta tell me what's gonna happen. This woman's about to be executed and I wanna try something else if you won't listen to me. And so he asked for documents back so he could try to get her a new trial, um, but he didn't hear anything back. And so in the days leading up to the scheduled November 17th execution, Mary Booth from her prison cell watched the erection of the gallows constructed to take her life its platform resting less than two feet beneath the jail window. A, a special coffin was ordered to accommodate her small body and it was there at the ready. And just the day before Booth's execution, Governor William Cameron issued a stay and commuted her sentence to death, citing her quote, extreme youth, less than 14, and the unanimous recommendation for clemency on the part of the jury who convicted her. So in a particularly hair-raising turn, while this news got picked up by some of Virginia's late newspapers, the evening papers, it didn't reach Surrey County um, until the next day. And so on the morning of November 17th, people flooded into town to witness Mary Booth's execution. Apparently, um, the sheriff in Surrey County feared that there might be a lynching. And so he had secretly taken her away by buggy heading towards Richmond to go to the Virginia Penitentiary. Um, and so, so she escaped seeing those crowds as, and obviously escaped execution. And the crowd was reportedly irate and called out for the jail to hand her over, promising that, quote, we'll settle with the governor. Among that crowd, however, was another person who was there not seeking her punishment, but to protect Mary Booth. Her father, Ben, was there in the crowd, and he told a reporter that um, he had made arrangements to try to rescue her, to kidnap her when she was being taken to the scaffold to try to liberate her from the prison. And in the end, he wasn't able to attempt that because she'd obviously been moved on to Richmond. Uh, so I'm just gonna switch slides here just to show, um, this is the, the clemency application the documents that gave me a lot of information about what happened to Mary Booth. Um, and the place where she went was the Virginia State Penitentiary. And I'm just going to show a couple of images so people have a sense of what it looked like. 
So Mary's boost relief at being spared execution must have quickly given way to some alarm as the sheriff took her further and further away from home and closer and closer to the prison where she could expect to spend the rest of her life. When she arrived in Richmond, Booth entered an institution that had first opened in 1800 um, and had been buffeted by the war and was now in the, um, in the 1880s straining under pressure from an exploding population of convicts that had been created in large part by discriminatory laws and policing policies that targeted black citizens. Penitentiary authorities perennially complained of overcrowding, but by 1883, they noted a dire state of affairs, given that the prison built to accommodate only 400 people at that point housed 800, making it necessary to put as many as 10 convicts in a single prison cell. Um, and I'm just putting up some statistics about the, the numbers of people who are housed there. So as a black female child prisoner at the Virginia Penitentiary, Mary Booth was unusual, but she wasn't singular. There were other children there. Um, the penitentiary housed prisoners from across the state who were sentenced to more than a year's confinement. And around the time that she arrived, there were 964 prisoners, 88 of whom were female, um, all but five of whom were black. And in 1882, they admitted 45 prisoners under the age of 18, bringing the total number of youth inmates resident in that year to 127. So there are a lot of women and a lot of children who are living in the prison, um, contrary to a lot of our assumptions about who's there. And, um, and I'll just note that this was also a change in, in practice. So in 1860, right before the American Civil War started, only four out of 357 inmates were under 18 years of age. By 1880, 116 out of 997 inmates were eight, under 18, so 12%. And as you can see in this graph, the numbers kept growing. I'm going to show one more visualization of how the numbers um, just, just increase, including the numbers of youth prisoners. And I'll, I'll note that officials in the penitentiary absolutely bemoaned the presence of children there. Um, they, but they also give no indication that they took measures to provide any kind of protective treatment for child inmates. Instead, it appears that prison authorities largely dealt with young prisoners by simply kind of assimilating them into the regular routines of the institution. And it's important to understand that the Virginia penitentiary um, was designed really to humiliate and to exploit the labor of people who were housed there. It had some stated ideals of reform and penitence, but they really took second, um, second sta stage to these earlier goals of, of humiliating prisoners and also um, taking advantage of their labor. And this is just one image of a convict chain gang um, that was put out to labor um, on the streets of Richmond in 1872. And if you'll notice on the side, one of those prisoners is clearly um, a child there on the far right. Um, and and the, the prison was, um, unsurprisingly, a very difficult place to be. Regulation stipulated silence uh, among prisoners. They couldn't read newspapers. Uh, they were, there were prescribed punishments that included things like whipping, the imposition of stripes on prisoners, the application of an iron mask or gag, and reduced rations, solitary confinement. Um, and there were no separate facilities for children. So children were mixed into the population of the prison. And it's also, there's no indication in the records that children were spared either those kinds of punishments or the kind of labor responsibilities that adult prisoners had to endure. And it's worth noting that Virginia never had a convict leasing system on the scale of states like Alabama and Georgia, which we know a lot about. Um, but for a quarter century after the Civil War, it regularly provided prison laborers to railroads, um, canals, and mining concerns throughout the state. And even though prison authorities recognized how deadly the work in those camps were, um, particularly those dedicated to canal work, which was really dangerous, they didn't excuse youth prisoners from such duties. So for example, Richard Lee, who was 13 when he was admitted for a three-year prison sentence, died in a labor camp, um, as did Robert Smith, who drowned in a canal, um, as did Jennings Booker, who also drowned uh, at age 14 while working on a canal. So this was, these were really dangerous jobs and it doesn't, children were not, um, were not spared doing them. Uh, and, 
although living in the penitentiary itself was less deadly than being sent out to the labor camps, the physical dangers of the penitentiary itself were substantial, especially for children. There was a lot of disease because of poor sanitation, and that claimed the lives of some children before they could complete their sentences, like Judy Overton, who died of malarial fever just two months after having entered the penitentiary at age 16. And it's also worth noting that um, some employers actually expressly requested young employees. So one of the places that did this was a cooperage, a place that built barrels. Um, and Joseph Anderson, uh, who ran this, this concern, specifically asked the superintendent for prisoners 14 and under, um, in part because he could pay less for them. So, so accessing the labor of incarcerated children is, is part of what was happening. Um, and, and and so that's part of the story here. But uh, it's worth noting, though, it does seem that um, most likely Mary Booth spent her time in the penitentiary um, within the penitentiary walls itself. By the time she was incarcerated, it was more unusual for women or girls to be sent out on the work parties, at least as far as the records that survive tell us. Um, and so instead, um, women and girls who were incarcerated tended to work within prison manufacturing and female um, incarcerated people had responsibility for um, sewing the clothing that prisoners wore, running the laundry, working um, as cooks and, and things like that. So, so most likely Mary Booth spent her time um, within the prison itself. Um, and, and that's as far as we can tell. And in fact, her time in the penitentiary coincided um, with the tenure of a new superintendent who was really committed to running the penitentiary on kind of business principles. Um, and he's constantly pursuing the goal and never really reaching it of trying to make the penitentiary um, revenue neutral for the state or even make it profitable, but he never succeeds in doing so, but he tries to get there by more efficiently exploiting the labor of, of prisoners. So one thing he does is he turns what had been the chapel into a manufacturing space to give women more space to work because he felt like women's labor was not being adequately exploited. So that's, that's probably what Mary Booth was doing. Um, I'll also note that Mary Booth's period of incarceration coincided with new calls for a youth reformatory, calls that would really go unanswered for another decade. In the annual report for 1883, penitentiary officials made a plea for a reformatory for young prisoners. In terms that made it clear, though, that girls like Mary Booth were not um, their primary concern. Prison reformers were really concerned with boys between the ages of 12 and 20 years of age. And when the state first began to divert children from jails in the penitentiary, it was white boys with whom they concerned themselves. Um, and what's more, the state relied on private organizations, specifically the Prison Reform Association organized in 1890 to help kind of spearhead this attempt to try to divert children who were convicted in courts from not being sent to jails, but instead being sent to reformatories. Um, but the efforts, these efforts, um, did not do a lot for the children who were already in the, the penitentiary. And because they were only aimed at white children, at least initially, it meant that, that black children um, continued to be sent to the penitentiary in significant numbers. Um, and so it's, it's also worth noting that um, African-American reformers in the late 19th century were also active trying to organize and demand separate facilities for black youth offenders, but it would take another decade to establish one for boys. Um, so, so we have in 1890, white boys began to be diverted in some small numbers. Um, in 1906, a reformatory for white girls was established. And it's not until 1915 that a home for African-American girls was established with the goal of keeping children out of the penitentiary. And even once these institutions were in place, black children continued to be sent to the penitentiary and were there in the 1930s, long after um, these separate institutions had been created. And so part of what I found in the research is that when age segregation became more the norm, that is when the state became more committed to trying to keep children out of the penitentiary, the fact that they only targeted that at white children um, meant that for a while, age segregation actually made the prison population more segregated by race. 
So in this strange way, the kind of reforms of, of juvenile justice, which meant taking children out of the penitentiary because they were expressly aimed at white children, meant that black children were disproportionately and ever more heavily um, subject to, to the unusual punishment of being confined to the, the penitentiary. So uh, despite uh, the kind of her heroic efforts by archivists to, to, to save the records of the penitentiary, sorry, change the slides there for a second, um, we, I still don't know very much about what happened to Mary Booth while she was there. I don't know if her family visited her. I don't know if she made friends. I don't know if she was targeted for violence. Um, but what we do know is that Mary Booth survived her incarceration and she was released from prison on Christmas Eve, 1885. So I'm going to talk about the second reprieve in Mary Booth's life. The second reprieve, um, the one that promised the restoration of her freedom, appears to have been the product of agitation by her parents and a community that refused to abandon her um, to the fate that had been prescribed by the state of Virginia. So Ben Booth, the father who had made plans to steal her away before the state could execute her, in 1885 carried another letter to the governor. No attorney was identified as having participated in putting this petition together, which seems to underscore the likelihood that it was Mary Booth's family that was really spearheading this attempt um, to get her released from prison. The year before she was arrested um, and incarcerated, Mary Booth had um, been baptized and her parson, a man by the name of Bailey Wyatt, tended to her while she was housed in the Surrey County Jail. Wyatt was the founding pastor of Lebanon Baptist Church, formed in 1882, the same year of Booth's trial. And he publicly insisted on Mary Booth's innocence when almost no one else did. In Surrey County, African-American churches were critical to the political life as well as the spiritual life of the county. Um, and it seems very likely that the networks uh, fostered by the Lebanon Baptist Church and perhaps by Bailey himself helped sustain the Booth family's pursuit of clemency um, for Mary Booth. Um, and maybe he's part of why a man like um, William Falcon, who was an African-American member of the House of Delegates um, for Prince George in Surrey County, added his name to the, his signature to this latest appeal um, for clemency. So, so part of what I think, even though it's hard to recover in the records, is that we're seeing the mobilization of family and church and local communities who come together to try to get clemency and get Mary Booth released from prison. Curiously, um, while the renewed appeal indicated that new information had shifted popular sentiment, all of the facts that appeared in the 1885 appeal pointing to Reuben Gray's guilt um, were in fact available in 1882. So Reuben Gray, whom you may recall, excuse me, I may sneeze in a second, forgive me, um, who was the, the grieving husband, shot himself five times with a revolver on August 27, 1882 in Disputanta, Virginia. So at the time of his shooting, uh, the, the Virginia press ascribed his actions to grief, but it seems much more likely that it was the product of guilt. Booth's lawyer had raised this matter in his September 1882 follow-up on his initial clemency file, filing in the one from June of 1882, again in September 1882, and now again in 1885. And back in 1882, um, at, at the time that uh, Mary Booth's sentence was initially commuted from execution, an Illinois newspaper reported um, that, quote, rumor now alleges that domestic infelicity resulted between Gray and his wife. On August 25th last, he attempted suicide with a revolver, um, and it is believed now that Gray was the victim of terrible remorse. So that's a story that was published in 1882. So what I'm underscoring is that all this information was there, but it was only in 1885 that the governor finally took it up. So whether the governor ignored evidence of Mary Booth's probable innocence or was ignorant of it, Mary Booth's incarceration reflected on some fundamental level the state's assessment that she was a disposable citizen. The prospect of sending a 14-year-old girl to the penitentiary for life did not constitute a crisis, moral or political, for state authorities, as much as it did for Mary Booth and her family. The governor's change of heart in 1885 likely reflected changed political circumstances um, rather than new information. Governor William Cameron was on his way out of office when he released Mary Booth on Christmas Eve, 1885. 
Just a month prior, Democrats had swept the readjusters and won all statewide elected offices, um, which prompted the disintegration of the readjuster party in Virginia. Mary Booth's supporters likely recognized that the changing political context made this the likely last and best opportunity for seeking redress, and they seized it. So I don't know whether Cameron acted out of deference to his own conscience or he was responding to the demands of constituents, but one of his last acts of office was, was um, commuting Mary Booth's sentence and releasing her from prison. Now the coverage of Mary Booth's release from prison was much more modest than the coverage of her trial. There was a little story in the Richmond Daily Dispatch, um, which used the news simply to remind people of the trial and noted that, quote, on account of her youth and other circumstances, the death sentence was commuted to imprisonment for life, and finally a pardon was granted, close quote. So you'll note, they don't say that she was innocent. They just say that she's been, her sentence has been commuted. So the story that the newspaper told was one of mercy by the governor, not a story of wrongful conviction. There was no exoneration of Mary Booth. There was no expression of regret. And that means that the kind of infamy of conviction and incarceration continued to hang over Mary Booth. So while the preceding account tells us frustratingly little about who Mary Booth was in some ways and how she understood the volatile political context around her, it reveals some important things about the relationships among age, race, and gender, and how they influenced the fates of, of citizens caught in the courts of Virginia in the 1880s. While Mary Booth's youth mattered to the authorities and public who determined her fate, its meaning could not be separated from her blackness that made incarceration imaginable for so many young citizens, um, or the femaleness that blurred the division between youthful innocence and adult responsibility. So what I'm arguing is that Booth's race and gender undercut, but did not altogether nullify her ability to benefit from legal and cultural deference given to children and their claims to innocence in criminal proceedings. The patterns of post-emancipation policing and criminal justice that made black children a familiar presence in the penitentiary over time though were very costly. They helped naturalize and intensify the association between blackness and criminality in ways that helped to deprive and continue to deprive many youth of color of, of the deference that we give to other children. So in conclusion, I, I'll, in conclusion, I'll just say a little bit about what the stories of Mary Booth and Virginia Christian tell us about the history of juvenile justice in, in Virginia. So I think part of what they tell us is that the character of childhood was really inconsistent. Right? We think of 19th century as a period where ideals of childhood innocence and play were really widespread. Um, and it's certainly celebrated in literature and culture in the 19th century US. But in reality, many children had very different lives from that. They had lives where they had to work um, for themselves and for their families. And that was true for Mary Booth in the 18th century and also true for um, Virginia Christian in the early 20th century. Uh, and also I think one of the things we see a commonality in their two stories is that for young African-American women, domestic um, be a kind of work that entailed a lot of risk, risk of conflict, risk of violence and risk of public suspicion. The other thing that's true in both of their stories is that the press played an important part in circulating the idea that it was a, a commonplace thing for, for um, domestic workers to engage in this kind of violence. And so I think that's part of what primes um, juries to be ready to believe those stories. But there are also some really important differences that I think explain the different outcomes with Booth ultimately being released from the penitentiary and Virginia Christian instead being executed by the state of Virginia. I think part of what is really different is the political context. So when Mary Booth went up for trial, reconstruction was over, but the readjuster party was still in power. African-Americans in Virginia still exercise political power and office holding power and influence. And I think that mattered for her being able to actually ultimately get her clemency appeal heard, even if she should never have been convicted in the first place. But by the time of Christian's trial, the consolidation of white supremacy in the state, which had intensified in the 1890s and had really been enshrined in the state constitution of 1902, had accelerated the disfranchisement of African-Americans and poor white Virginians. Um, and that meant that segregation had really taken hold. So there were no black jurors on Virginia Christian's trial. Um, and 
the, the government had pursued a lot of reforms. This is the era of progressive reforms, including juvenile justice. But essentially what we find is that those um, reforms towards juvenile justice were simply outpaced by the reforms that made legal segregation a reality um, and the harms that that kind of segregation brought in the lives of, of people like Virginia Christian. So ultimately, I'll, my last sentence is Mary Booth and Virginia Christian demonstrate that legal protections for children in the absence of rights for the communities of which they were a part just really couldn't be meaningful. And um, although the campaign that was mounted by the National Association of Colored Women and W.B. Du Bois um, tried to spare Virginia Christian, um, it couldn't succeed in the face of the weight of a system of white supremacy and the way it was enshrined in law. Nevertheless, it was part of an ongoing um, commitment and campaign to try to protect black children, one that had begun bef before the Civil War and which continues into the present day. So, um, so I think I will, I will leave it there um, and I'll stop sharing and check in and see if there are any questions um, and go from there. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Kate. Um... And I'm going to ask the folks watching, uh, again, if you have any questions that you'd like to submit, um, you can type them into the comments section of our Facebook stream. Um, and I, I don't see any right now, but, uh, but I'll just go, go ahead and say, I, I was really struck by this case study and, and how it, it really links into and I'm sorry, I can't, for some reason, my video is not coming back on Catherine. So you're, you're, enjoying the museum logo, but I was really impressed by it, by how this case study linked with so many other, you know, continuing and larger themes that, you know, go back into the 18th century and continue on the 20th century from the, you know, the idea of the, of the uh, African-American domestic worker who is, who is a internal threat. And yet at the same time, this beneficent boon, you know, you go back to, uh, you know, the, the slave poisonings um, in the 18th century and early 19th century. Um, and then, you know, you can carry that theme forward into, uh, you know, domestic workers working in households and urban areas in the early part of the 20th century through the mid 20th century. Um, and, and then even just, you know, the, the ideas of reform and, um, you know, just the, 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 convict lease system and, and all of that. I was, I was, well, I was, you were speaking, I was thinking of uh, making a lot of uh, connections between your work and uh, the, the steel driving man, the study about John Henry. Um, so again, different, but yet, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of connections that I was making to what you were saying and what I remember from, from when I had read that a number of years ago. Um, so yeah, it's just a really, really interesting case study uh, in terms of the, you know, the themes that you're tying into. Well, thank, thank you for that. And I, th I think it's, I think it's true that her, um, Mary Booth's life does intersect with a lot of other developments mm -hmm. and, and there are mm -hmm. continuities um, with the developments before the civil war and certainly long after. So I think mm -hmm. that's part of my interest is that I think this period um, in the 1880s, it's a transition period and it's, there's kind of an assumption that we go immediately from the end of reconstruction into the kind of nadir of Jim Crow, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a part of, especially in the context of Virginia. And I think it's something, you know, growing up in Virginia, I'd never heard of the readjuster party mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to realize that in fact, even when the federal government has kind of walked away from many mm -hmm. of the commitments of reconstruction, within the state of Virginia, there are people who are demanding and succeeding in getting those rights for Black Virginians respected and, mm -hmm. and the political mm -hmm. power of Black Virginians continues to shape the state. And so I think um, I think part of what I'm interested in is, is trying to kind of bring more light to that because I think it's such an important right. part of the state's history that just is is very little known. And it, it is- Absolutely. Short Absolutely. Are really consequential. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, from, from my perspective, you know, I, I primarily a civil war uh, historian and, you know, I can tell from a lot of people that I talk to, you know, they're familiar with William Mahone as the civil war general, but they don't know about William Mahone 
who was a leader in the readjuster party. Um, and, and there's not a lot of scholarship about that. That's, that's easily accessible. And, and like you were saying, I think that's, I think Virginia is pretty unique in terms of that party and, and kind of what it was doing in terms of, of what's going on in other states. And I'm, you know, having gone to grad school in South Carolina, and I'm fairly familiar with what was going on in, in South Carolina. And that was very similar to what was going on in Mississippi and Louisiana, but, but Virginia is really an outlier in a lot of ways. So, you know, what, what you're doing, I think is, you know, in shedding some light on that is really important. Thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah, and there's some, there's some great work on, on the readjusters. Brent Tarter at the Library of Virginia, Virginia has written a book on it, Jane Daly um, at University mm -hmm. of Chicago. So there, there is stuff out there, but it's true. It's just, it's just not, um, it's not widely known. And I think, mm -hmm. and, and I think, and, and Mahone is such a fantastic character. He's, mm -hmm. he's um, people who don't know him, you should Google his image and you'll see he looks kind of like a leprechaun. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But he, um, but it's it's uh, in the state of Virginia. We do we have people who had served in the Confederate Army um, in positions of command who then become ardent supporters of this mm -hmm. this party um, for complicated political reasons. Right, it does right. Create a, create a space for um, continuing to nurture some of the political developments of Reconstruction, and mm -hmm. I think they really do carry benefits for for black Virginians, although they don't mean that people aren't still subject to mm -hmm. um, the harms of discrimination and violence. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a it's a murky story, which is yeah. always a harder one to tell. Yeah. But I think it's also really important because it's kind of part of where we live, where politics yeah. is complicated. It right. may, means difficult compromises. It means unsatisfactory outcomes. But in out of that, there's a little bit more space for a little bit more possibility of something closer to justice. Um, mm -hmm. So that's part of why I find this period so, so interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I don't, I don't see any questions. Oh, wait, I, I have one question came in. Um, would you be able to generalize quote unquote, the South, or is it best to say only in this state or in this county? Definitions of childhood is fascinating, but then divided by perceived race. I think that kind of gets into what we were just chatting about. Um, but uh, I don't know if there's anything else that you you wanted to add or could think of in, in response yeah, to that. I mean no, I appreciate the comment, and it's always nice to know there are people out in the ether. Um, and I think that in some ways, the, I think it is, I find it's very interesting to think about what childhood meant and how people knew someone was mm -hmm. a child. So one thing to know is that in this period, you know, the birth certificate, the thing that we think of as what defines age, mm -hmm. how we know mm -hmm. how old somebody is, is not widespread. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so there might be records like a family Bible or something like that. But, but in reality, people's age is largely the information that is held by their families mm -hmm. um, and is largely judged by their appearance. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things that's really interesting is how people mobilize claims to age, because the law does make some important distinctions um, that are generally set by the state. So, so the questioner's right, there, there is to some degree a state-by-state -state story here, but also within individual communities. Um, the question of who is a child is ultimately determined kind of by the people who are looking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only later in the 20th century when the kind of documentary regime that we know, we know about providing all kinds of identification and stuff like that, um, that I, that age becomes a really fixed notion. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of why I do think that other other characteristics like race, um, like gender really shade the meanings of age. And so, so like I said, some of that shows up in law, you know, like women can get married, uh, women's age of consent is lower than male um, children's age of consent was. Um, and and that, that's something that's produced in the law, but questions about where people fall in that line are ultimately often adjudicated by people's perceptions. Um, and, and so that's part of what I, I'm trying to, to get at here is that not the, the number attached to Mary Booth is it can only be part of the story because um, it this is still a period where community perception is very powerful. Um, and I think that's also part of what's distinctive about this, about the 19th century, that is, does make it a little bit different um, from now is even after the Civil War, even after Reconstruction, community standing continues to be extremely important. Um, 
And that's part of why I'm surprised that Reuben Gray never didn't come in for suspicion because he was an outsider. You know, people didn't know him. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why I think it speaks to the power of racial assumptions um, right. and assumptions right. about domestic workers that they could kind of overwhelm um, the idea that this was an outsider and who, you know, whose behavior at best seemed quite suspicious at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, do you think there could did? I don't remember, where did you say that they had come from? It was somewhere up north. They'd come from Chicago. They, okay. they have a curious story. They'd met in Colorado. He'd been out there trying to be a miner. Uh, uh -huh. Not a, not a physic. He was the son of a mayor of Chicago. So he's a, he's a kind of an elite guy. And um, his wife was a successful investor in Colorado. So they must have had some money, but it sounded like they had to get out of town because his business stuff was not very, very well run. Um, yeah. And so they make this move. So I don't know really, but it kind of sounds like they're kind of leaving a somewhat dicey past behind and mm -hmm. then coming to get a fresh start in Virginia. But he said, yeah, I, I almost wonder if, if there was some element in, in that community of, you know, you're saying these outsiders, um, you know, and this is, this is a little bit after the, you know, the carpet bagger identity thing, but, but I still wonder if, depending on what they were, what they were saying in their community and what their attitudes were about coming into that area. If, mm -hmm. if there was some sort of sense of, oh, you, you know, look at these progressives coming down to, you know, improve our state and, and their, you know, we warn them about employing these people and, and look what happened. And so maybe there's kind of a, we kind of got what was coming to you. And this is, you know, this is a lesson learned for you. And we're going to, mm. uh, you know, build it into a larger, you know, kind of community morality tale um, about, you know, uh, you know, being vigilant about, uh, you know, racial mores uh, or something like that. I don't know. Just, yeah, just a it, thought that I had. Yeah. It's, uh, it's I, I, I don't have any evidence to suggest yeah, that. Yeah, you know, and like I'm, I'm sure you would never be able to find anything like that yeah. in print, you know. And of course, there isn't anybody around to be more to ask. But uh, you yeah. know, it's just, just kind of something that you like wonder if there was anything like that going on. Yeah, I think the fact that she had a sister who lived nearby, and I think in some ways, I I kind of had a, the opposite interpretation that mm -hmm. their employment of black women as as domestic workers, I kind of took it that they're really coming in and kind of embracing the the practices of the region um and and that maybe that's part of why he's not he's mm -hmm. not a, a quick suspect but mm -hmm. but you're right i mean it, it you know i think it, it speaks to the fact that there's a lot more dynamism of people moving around mm -hmm. in this period more strangers for all kinds of reasons and so so i think one thing we sometimes people tend to to think about the american south as a as a fairly static place, even through the 19th century. And, and part of what we really know, certainly the Civil War produces a lot of churning, but, but that really continues throughout the 19th century um, as people are, are on the move for business reasons, for mm. personal reasons, to put families back together, all kinds of things. And so, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's tantalizing, but I don't think there's a clear, clear answer. Mm. There. So. Um, well, I think that was the only comment that we had. Um, and, uh, I, I really thank you for, you know, the, the depth of, of your presentation and, uh, and the length of it. It was, uh, this was, this was good. So again, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, those of you, uh, still watching, uh, thank you again for, uh, joining us for this evening's program with the Museum of Culpeper History. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Jones. Uh, and we will go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully see you at our next our next webinar uh, next month. So thank you for thank you for joining us again.